Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday and the beginning of Holy Week. Um, I've got a couple of announcements before we do that, though. Um, there's a song that has been sung here at St. Peter's to, to begin the Palm Sunday service and to begin Holy Week uh, ever since... Ever? Ever. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll speak a little. So ever. <laughs> They're all aging themselves up terribly for a long time. It's been ever since the Diane was a child. So, but, but I, I realized, me being one of the relatively new people to the church, we don't know the song. that The lyrics are printed, but we don't know what to sing along with it. So I have asked the, uh, the work Sharon's going to play, and the choir's going to sing the first verse. Just listen to it, so that when it comes to our time to sing, we'll at least be able to fake it through. And if you don't know it well enough, just mouth the words. <laughs> Diane will take care of it for us. <laughs> All right, ready? Get 
a full, full picture. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew what that was all about. So put that on your save the date, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it as the time comes. Uh, since I'm here on time. Oh, we love it. Thank oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> you. Ask all the men to help with men's breakfast. If you look at the key, it says that there's an eight, uh, 7 o'clock service, and then men's breakfast is 8 p.m. That's an error. It's 8 a.m. The second service at 9 30. Hope to see you there. We've got a lot of cooks. I see them here and they're ready to go. Thank you. Okay, so if you can help out with that guy, yeah. see Paul, uh, Paul afterwards, and he'll get you on the list. Anything else that we need to share? We'll see nothing then.
It is truly a joy in the life of every congregation when we get to participate in, in the baptism of a new life in Christ and in the life of this church. So as we prepare for the baptism of Madison Avery Cummins, I would invite her parents, Katie and Kay, and her grandparents, Joe and Ray Cummins, Gloria and Larry Hawks, Larry will be watching down from heaven. I think that's it. Oh, and Helen. <laughs>
gathered to witness and celebrate this sacrament, promise your love, your support, and your care to the one about to be baptized as she lives and grows in Christ. If so, please respond. We promise our love, support, and care. We promise our love, support, and care. Please be seated. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the gift of creation calling forth by your saving word. Before the world had shape and form, your spirit moved over the waters. Out of the waters of the deep you formed the firmament and brought forth the earth to sustain all life. In the time of Moses, your people Israel passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom and crossed the flowing Jordan to enter the Promised Land. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus Christ, who was nurtured in the water of Mary's womb. Jesus was baptized by John in the water of the Jordan, became living water to a woman at the Samaritan well, washed the feet of the disciples, and sent them forth to baptize all nations by water and the Holy Spirit. Blessed by your Holy Spirit, gracious God, this water. By your Holy Spirit, save those who confess the name of Jesus Christ, that sin may have no power over them. Create new life in the one baptized this day, that she may rise in Christ. Glory to you, eternal God, the one who was and is and shall always be, world without end. Amen.
she got Clyde for that. present to you now her baptismal certificate, the legal document binding her and us together forever. In the story of the book, the book of stories of her faith that you may share with her as she comes to know who she is and more importantly, who she is. I love that.
Yesterday at 9 a.m., Kathy and Drew were at Enterprise, Enterprise rent a car, running a car, driving to Nashville. They picked up Alex, and they're in St. Louis now, and will be coming back, uh, coming back later today. So, uh, so we will have him for a couple of weeks. I was really glad that it worked out the way that it did. I didn't want to have him here uh, before Madison was baptized because, well, quite frankly, I, I, I shared with Helen beforehand. I really hate to burst anybody's bubble, but. But he is the most beautiful, perfect, intelligent <laughs> grandchild that ever existed. So now all of those pictures and times that I had to put up with y'all, just sit down and take it. <laughs> so for traveling graces uh, for my family as they come back home, and a real joy of being able to spend the Easter holiday with our grandson. Lord, in your mercy. Hi, I'm um, Jennifer Lucas, but I was Jenny Hawk for a long time. Um, I'm Eileen's daughter. Um, I'm here with her twin sister Kathleen today just to thank everybody for all your prayers and especially for the cards that you sent. Um, she is living with her sister in a parade now, so she doesn't get to see all of us as often as she'd like to. She probably won't be back here. Um, so we do appreciate all of your, everything from Facebook posts to cards, mean the world to her. Um, and so I just ask that you continue to keep all of us in your prayers, especially my dad, who has to travel between Frankfurt and Valparaiso to be with her, um, and also has to work really hard, too. So um, if you can continue prayers for us, I appreciate it. Um, additionally, the boys and I are doing something special for her for Easter, um, and I would love to ask the help of the congregation. Um, we are writing, we're collecting, um, encouraging notes, uh, letters, things like that from her friends and family,
our faith. So I, I just thank God for the local family, and I just am so thankful that that love surrounds Madison and Mason and my children all the time. Lord, in your mercy. The next time you see Kathy Dutra, please give her a big thank you. She does so much for our children on our Sunday school. Yesterday morning we had an Easter celebration, and with the help of some young teenagers, seventh and eighth graders, it was wonderful. This grandma got to bring her little grandson, and the little children loved it, and she had them so organized and such good listeners. And another thing, Dave, thanks for everything. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, your mercy. I'm Joyce Anders. I'm Sharon's partner. We share duties as an organist. I have joy and a concern. My joy is that next Sunday I'm going to be privileged to play for the seven o'clock service. I'm sure I can get up. I'm sure I can uh, be prepared. However, I do not trust that I'll be able to get an Uber next Sunday at 6.30. So, if there's anybody who's coming at, to, the, to the 7 o'clock service and can put in 15 extra minutes and pick me up, that would be great and it would relieve me of this concern. I've got one volunteer over here. I'll be downstairs. Okay. Thank you. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other day, I, I went into the dollar store. We were doing some stuff for kids, and I bought a bunch of uh, dollar boxes of candy. There was a lady behind me, and, and, uh, and she said, wow, she said, I hadn't thought of that idea before. She said, aren't you going to buy all these boxes of candy for a dollar and take them and sell them outside the theater? <laughs> no. You, know, you can make even more. She's been silly. We were laughing. And she said, oh, but I don't know if that's ethical. And I said, well, it's okay. I'm a pastor on the internet. <laughs> And she said, oh, really, where are you a pastor at? I said, oh, well, I'm in St. Pete. Is all I got out was St. Pete. She said, oh, Frank, you're pastor of the Church of Frankfurt. <laughs> so we have, been, we have been designated now, St. Peter's United Church of Christ, the Church of Frankfurt. <laughs> Give yourselves all a hand.
She will spend the next few weeks in, in kind of an isolation as they, as the system gets to know her uh, and, and how she will handle things and find a place for her to, uh, to work there in, in prison and, and exactly how it all work out. In that period of time, uh, nobody is able to, to, to visit her or to be with her or to reach out at all. Once that period of time is over, and the family is able to be with her, and I'm able to go down and be with her. Uh, I, I will let you all know, and I'll also make sure that you have her address of how you can get a hold of her, uh, as we have been and hopefully will continue to reach out and love and support for Eileen and the family. It is my hope and my prayer that as a congregation, we can find it in our hearts to even if each one of us does it once a month, just drop a little note, just drop a little card. I want Lindsay to know with complete certainty that when, when her time is over and the proverbial debt is paid to society, that she has a family to come home to. Not just her parents and, and her brother Corey, but that she has a church family. That the, the moment she is able to walk in that door, she will be embraced with love and support <clears throat> and whatever else she might need for it. For the next few days, I would ask uh, uh, Rick and Andre to ask me to let you know if you just kind of leave them alone for a couple of days <laughs> as they deal with this. But sometime after Easter, drop them a note. Give them a call. Reach out. Any, anything that, that you can do to, to help them through a time that, in their words, I hope nobody else ever has to experience again. So, for Lindsay, for Andrea, and Rick, and her brother, Cory, as they begin this, this five years of Who knows? Lord, in your mercy. So for these, for these concerns that have been shared, for the joys that have been shared, for the joy of new life brought into our church, into the, the church of Jesus Christ, for the concerns and the joys that each one of us brings with us. And, and we choose to share privately and quietly with them. I would invite us now to bow our heads and be in a time and a spirit of prayer. A holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this glorious, glorious Palm Sunday morning that we awoke to. For the privilege that it gave us to, to be able to come, to, to gather, to have the little ones lead us in shouts of Hosanna, songs of praise and, and celebration for this, for this first day of, of the holiest week in the year for all of us who come to you through Jesus Christ. God, we, we ask that, that this year that we be truly mindful of just what Holy Week is. Of the events that transpired from Sunday to Sunday. The lessons, the suffering, the sorrow, the doubt, the pain, and the cross that are all a part of, of this week that we travel with, with you and with our Savior, the one who, who actually lived it. We pray that we are mindful that that the joy of, of Palm Sunday, the celebration, the cheering, the laughter, it did 
did not go right from this to the resurrection. We pray that we, that we truly recognize and appreciate that without, without the doubt, without the denial or the betrayals, without the whips, without the crown of thorns, without the shouts of crucify and without the cross itself, that the glory and the wonder that is Easter, without them it just could not be. So help us to face the reality of this week. And the reality of all our lives. That between each one of the peaks that we celebrate and love and cherish, there are times where we must dwell in the valley. Help us to realize that just as you help us to, to experience the peace, that you are there with us in the valleys, that your rod and your staff, that it may provide us comfort and solace. Help us to be truthful, realistic, and honest about this week, for only then can we gather next Sunday and truly, truly rejoice. Gracious God, we lift this prayer up to you as we have shared with you our concerns and our joys. And we bring them all to you and we pray together in one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The reading from the Christian Gospels this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had re reached Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt for the foal of the donkey. The disciples went and did as, as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him, ahead of him, and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth, Galilee. Hear what the Spirit says to the church.
sermon that I had set up, because we're running a little over, because we had a lot of announcements in the radio. Chip's really excited about that. He heard a short sermon, and he didn't. <laughs> One of the things that we need to realize is that when we think about Jesus as, as the Messiah and whatever we consider, we need to remember that, that what happened, the events that transpired, and everything that was written down occurred in first century Palestine. So one of the mistakes that we all too often make is that we put our own biases and prejudice and understandings into the events that, that occurred at that time when the people then would have, they would have known what we were talking about. So in order to see this story and to understand it and to be a part of it fully, we need to, to, to realize a couple of things. The first, the first is that the, the Jewish people did not envision a Messiah. There were going to be two Messiahs. There was going to be a political Messiah that was going to come take care of that aspect of people's life. And there was going to be a, a spiritual Messiah that was going to come to deal with that aspect of people's life. Nowhere did they expect one person to come take care of of all people's needs. That just wasn't the case. You know, as, as, we get, as we hear and read the stories of Jesus' life up until Palm Sunday, he's pretty much dealing with everybody's spiritual, spiritual well-being. Teaching them what it means to, to be a faithful member of the kingdom of God and to live into the covenant that, that we make when we claim it. The other thing that we need to keep in mind always is that this separation of church and state that we hold to be self-evident and something that is there and written in blood and should have, this is all a relatively new thought in, in the minds of human beings. For the vast majority of human history and human civilization, they were so, so enmeshed and so wrapped up, there was no having church without state. Or there was no way of dealing with the state without your faith. So with those things in mind, and we come to this Palm Sunday, we need to realize that Jesus is, is in his mind, his understanding, he now is bringing together these two understandings of the sign that the Jewish people would have had. In the events of Palm Sunday and the next few days, he will claim both of those mantles as political and as spiritual, living together in one person that each one of us gathered here have what we've committed our lives to, to following and to trying to be like. See, when he came in on that, that donkey riding, having people yelling hosannas, that was a 100% undeniable, in-your-face emperor political action on his part. See, the only people that ever rode into the city, whatever city, with a parade like Jesus was having, with people paying homage and praise to him, were conquering heroes. They were the emperors and the generals and the leaders that had gone forth and, and helped to expand the Roman Empire. One of their gifts was this ability to have this, what they call a triumph, where everybody turned out to watch and to give, give praise and honor and homage to, to the one that had served Rome and Caesar, by helping to, to expand and to solidify the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. So Jesus coming in on this donkey, I mean, he was just throwing everything completely upside down. Yes, he was making a political statement, no doubt about it whatsoever. But when a general or a leader came in on a triumph, they rode on a pure white stallion. 
the biggest that could be found. They were draped in gold, solid gold armor, with headdress and, and plumage from the most rare and ox, excuse me, exotic birds that they could find. They were decked out for everybody to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this dude did something. Now here comes Jesus on a donkey in basically rags, not being showered with rose petals and, and gold coins, but rather the cloaks of peasants and broken palm fronts thrown to him. It's completely the opposite. Jesus was saying, including into the gate that he went in, which is the one on the complete opposite side of Jerusalem from where a triumph would be. Jesus was saying to everyone, and especially to the Roman leaders, in your face, this, this is the way it's done in God's kingdom. Forget the empire of Rome and of Caesar. This is the one that's important, and this is the way we do it. We don't look for honor and glory and being grandly paraded and celebrated. Rather, we come in humbly and meekly knowing that, that anything we have been able to do did not occur because of, of us or any goodness in us, but rather it occurred through the power of God and to God. To God be the glory. Not to the general. Not to Caesar. And not to Rome. So Jesus starts out Holy Week with this blatant political statement. And if he'd have left it there, hey, maybe things would have been okay. But no! He had to get all nuts and decide, well, you know what? Now I'm going to show them that I'm also the spiritual Messiah. That God has called me to be his conduit to God's people. So he goes into the temple. The temple. The most precious. The most honored. The most sacred place in all of Judaism. He goes into the temple and on Tuesday, Monday night Tuesday, do you know what he does? Yeah, you all know what he does. The boy throws a royal hissy fit. And he starts knocking over tables and letting doves and sheep and goats go. The pigeons are flying. The doves are going. It's absolute chaos. And he looks at the Sadducees, the leaders of the temple, and he said, This, this is my father's house. This should be a temple of prayer and justice and compassion, not... Not a den of thieves, not a place where, where you try to find how you, can, how you can skim the money off, how you can control the people, how you can make yourselves the ones that they come to rather than going just to God. See, this is one of those times when I read, excuse me, when I read the, the stories about Jesus and, and, and one of the things that you learn, you learn right off the bat, if you have any common sense whatsoever, when you accept the call to the ministry and, and the preaching ministry, people love, love to hear about Jesus. People having a downtime, preach about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. That's great. Now you want to make them mad? Tell them what Jesus preached. Tell them what Jesus said. Tell them what Jesus' example means for us in today's world. And that's what this Palm Sunday is about, sisters and brothers. We cannot. It is unchristian. We cannot divorce ourselves our political selves, and political just in group, from our secular and our spiritual selves. 
Everything, everything that we do reflects back on what we believe. And when our actions do not coincide with the words coming out of our mouth, the words coming out of our mouth lose any credence. Because it's in the actions that we take as individuals, as a congregation, and as a nation that reflects who, and more importantly, as I say always, whose we are. We profess to be a people of Jesus Christ, to follow the one who is self-proclaimed Prince of Peace. Just a few, few months ago, we had banners. We had readings about that. We all said, oh, this is great, this is wonderful. And I find that all too often the choices that are made and that quite frankly we go along with rather than rather they be enthusiastically going along with them or just passively saying, well, I can't do anything about it. Do not in any way reflect the teachings of the one whose passion we are about to remember. Whose death this week we are about to bemoan and wail. And whose resurrection we say makes us free. It makes us free, but not, not to live as we want. But rather to follow the teachings, the ministry, and most importantly, the example of the one that each and every one of us here proclaim to be our personal Lord and Savior. So as we move on through this Palm Sunday, as it leads us to Monday, Thursday, and the time in the upper room, which leads us then to the Garden of Gethsemane, to trials, to betrayals, to whippings, to being spat upon, and ultimately to the cross. Let us remember that Jesus lived all of this. As an example. An example for each and every one of us that so boldly proclaim that we follow the risen Savior. Well, yeah. But he had to go through a lot of hell before he was risen. And he did. He went through the events of this week faithfully. Trusting. Trusting not. Not in the ways of, of man. Not in the systems of civilization. But trusting on the everlasting and ever faithful promises of God. It was that that led him through Passion Week. Led him to the tomb and also to that which we will so joyously and wondrously and rightfully celebrate next week. So I beseech, I beg each and every one of us during this week to look at the choices we make and that we have made and that we are considering it as individuals, each and every one of us, as, as families, so many that I see here represent. As a congregation. <coughs> and lastly, but obviously not leastly, as a nation. Are, are we?
we willing to live? And to go through times of, of unbelievable horror. Trusting in God. Obviously that's for each and every one of us to decide. Individually, corporately, politically. All I know is there is absolutely zero doubt. None whatsoever can't be disputed by anybody. The choice that Jesus made. And to him was all the honor and the glory. And quite frankly, the reward. The right hand of God for his faithfulness. How will we live? How will we choose? Whose will we be? Amen. I would now invite all that are able to please stand as we join together in hymn number 203, Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
that were used to raise and shout hosannas on this Palm Sunday will be used to create the ashes when we begin next Lenten season on Ash Wednesday. Now may the mercy of God, the love of Christ, 
and the strength of the Holy Spirit be with you this week and all the weeks of your life. Amen.